Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am from the Shoni Institute. My name is Audrey Spaulding. I am the policy analyst there. Um, due to time constraints, I really just want to talk about the cost of this measure, if given the time that I have. There are three major cost components of this legislation, already brief, uh, briefly discussed. Uh, very simply, the $60 million that would be to freight companies for shipping cargo out of the state. Uh, incidentally, the state will give more money to companies shipping perishable freight. $120 million in tax credits would help to pay off interest costs associated with the debt incurred to build cargo warehouses and facilities. $300 million of $480 million in tax credits proposed would go to owners of cargo warehouses. The amount of the credit is tied specifically to property purchases, construction costs, as well as brokerage fees and attorney fees. All of the above adds up to the $480 million that has been discussed here today. But there, is addition, there are additional costs within this bill. Uh, a closer read of the proposed legislation said this bill would be even more expensive. I am talking specifically about the tax exemptions contained within this bill. In addition to the tax credits awarded, any tenant or entity operating an eligible facility would be exempt from state income tax and the state corporation franchise tax. The legislation does not include a limit on those costs. Furthermore, the state fiscal note, which was supposed to estimate costs associated with this legislation, has not attempted to estimate those costs either, noting only, quote, that these exemptions will reduce general and total state revenues in an unknown amount. Furthermore, uh, not only will cargo warehouse operators be exempt from the state income tax, but they could also keep half of these state tax, these state income taxes withheld from employees. Again, the proposed legislation doesn't limit the amount that this could add up to, and the state fiscal note doesn't estimate this lost revenue. Incidentally, this particular provision within the Aerotropolis bill appears to match up with state tax income and financing that was awarded to the Lambert Eastern Perimeter Redevelopment Project in 2006, meaning that development in this area is, in effect, already subsidized. Uh, it, there's been discussion briefly about the, the China Hub and Aerotropolis and what is the correct name for this. And um, I just want to restate that this, you know, that this, these, these subsidies are not contingent on any agreement with China, but just in the hope that one would materialize. Um, finally, I was surprised to hear today that the RCGA study would be made available. When I contacted the Midwest China Hub Commission last week, I was told that the study promised in August, that, the, that when in 2010, when Mike Jones of the China Hub Commission said that there would be a study forthcoming, um, that it still wasn't available last week. In, in case anyone is interested, I have brought a copy of the feasibility study that Cleveland completed last year and that was made available to the public prior to the state proposing any such tax credits related to a proposed international hub. So that, that's the end of my testimony. Any questions? Sir, I'm sorry, the name of your organization again? The Show Me Institute. Oh, very good, thank you. Sir Dixon. I was just curious in listening to your testimony there about the cost, if you did any sort of analysis with respect to the opportunity cost of, let's say we don't do it, it goes somewhere else. Well, I, um, I have not done that study. We haven't had the time to do that study, given that the air travel tax credits, the amounts in particular, were recently uh, agreed upon. I think that that would assume that the, one, that the tax credits are necessary to the creation of an international hub, and two, that such an international hub would be successful. I think, you know, regardless, I think anyone can agree upon the fact that there is at least a possibility that this is not successful. And, um, I, think, I, guess, well, I was just going to say, I, I, I would be interested to, you know, if, if you're going to present a study like that, or, or I'd be interested to see some sort of analysis on, on that. Because a lot of times we do things, recently we uh, sent the governor's desk to phase out of the global franchise tax, but I don't think that your organization is here to testify against that because of the cost. Um, I realize it's a different issue, but it seems to be an opportunity that if it's lost, we could uh, certainly lose out, and I'd, I'd like to see us calculate that cost. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for coming up here uh, and testifying. 
Um, I totally disagree with your analysis. Um, uh, do you the 400? You made reference to the 480 million dollars. Are you aware of how long it would take for the 480 million? If everything hit, how long it would it take? Yes, I realize that would not hit immediately. I you know how long the period of time is? I believe it's more than a decade. Fifteen years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, if everything hits, if we hit the freight forward piece, if we're building facilities, we have industry we don't have in our state right now, and the only way that they get the credit is they invest in a 20 to 25 million dollar building. They're operating, they've created jobs, we have the kind of economic activity that we're seeking with the legislation that we don't have. I do not understand how an organization that seems to at least um, uh, state that they're for economic growth cannot get behind an idea of, of incenting people to come and do things that we just don't have. So my question is, if this is a real possibility, uh, is it worth doing? If, if, if China, which is first in, is going to move and want to have the ground that they don't have in Chicago. Uh, is that worth having in our state? Well, I think, you know, perhaps we approach this from a different, each from different standpoints, obviously. Now, we're talking here about this proposed international hub, and of course there have been talks with China and other countries that this would be one of the Given that those talks are occurring, isn't it also is possible that St. Louis area developers and other such entrepreneurs would be entrepreneurial enough to seize upon such an opportunity without state help. But if you don't have, the, my question to you is, if it doesn't happen, and I know you're seeking some sort of like letter of a memorandum of understanding or something, if it doesn't happen, none of this revenue that we would be foregoing, because that's what it is, we're foregoing revenue, which I find it interesting actually, um, as a Republican I hear a lot, is really what we're doing here is, we are reducing the tax liability to create it, to have an industry in our state that we don't have, okay? I don't find that offensive in any way. I think that's actually, people campaign a lot about this, about job growth, about opportunities, about having creating an economic environment in our state that's conducive to the creation of quality jobs. Well, here it is. You know, and, and being critical of a new idea that's old isn't anything new or isn't anything unique. I'm sure the steamboat captains of the, the late 1800s thought that the railroads uh, were something that threatened their interests, or that people would be uh, inconvenienced as their homes or property might be bought out to make way for the new mode of transportation. But guess what? Uh, one city got it right. Chicago got it right. And St. Louis was standing on the sidelines. I don't want to be, I don't want to be remembered. There's a mural in the Senate, I spoke this last time, of the first senator, Senator Benton, who was talking about having that westward expansion of the railroad from St. Louis to the West Coast, and we missed it, okay? I don't, I'm, what I'm saying this session is, this is important enough that I think we need to stand up for growing the pie. And I know that there's going to be plenty of people that poke holes and have criticism, but that's what critics do, okay? It's our job up here to seize on an opportunity to grow our economy, and there couldn't be anything more real or more immediate than being in the center of an international trade hub. Any great civilization, any great city has been at the confluence of routes, of commerce, of industry. That's what we have an opportunity here. And just because we want to live in an ivory tower and we want to give great speeches about what things might look like if we lived in some utopian world, we don't live in that world. We don't live in that world. So we can choose to compete or we can be economic isolationists and we can build a great wall around our state. I think it's our job as this committee and in the Senate in this session to break down those walls, to open up trade routes, to, to create opportunity for Missouri businesses, the ag community, we heard from the pork producers today, this is an opportunity that we haven't seen in this state. And so I appreciate, I really do appreciate you coming up here. I appreciate uh, your different point of view. I've seen some of your articles. I haven't had a chance to visit with you. We haven't had a chance to talk about the legislation. I'd be happy to do that with you more. Um, I know that you were probably coming into a, a room where there was a lot of support. So I do appreciate that, but I respectfully disagree. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, any other witnesses in opposition? Hi, my name is Christine Harvin. I also work for the Shelby Institute. Um, and we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, Missouri based think tank that supports free market solutions for state policy. Uh, Initially, I was 
going to testify in tandem with my colleague, Audrey, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to testify separately. I'm going to hit two points. Uh, hopefully, they will, I think they're very relevant to the discussion we just had. Uh, the first point is uh, about the use of tax credits and the as a strategy for economic development in Missouri. And the second one, uh, I'm going to concentrate on the topic of concentrated benefits and fees costs and the idea that rural taxpayers will put the bill. Tax credits are not free money. Supporters of this project argue that it won't cost the taxpayers a dime. This is far from the truth. Tax credits are real money and they do not appear out of thin air. They come from the pockets of taxpayers. Even though the recipients of tax credits will pay less in taxes, everyone else will bear the burden of their benefit. Unless every tax credit is offset by real spending cuts of the same amount, every dollar that the government spends on tax credits has to be raised through higher taxes, debt, or a reduction in services. It means that everybody other than the tax credit recipient is getting less or paying more. Think of it this way. When the state gives a, a company tax credits, that means that the company won't be paying those taxes, obviously. This means that less revenues will flow through the state treasury. The government therefore has fewer dollars to pay for schools, fix roads, and build bridges. One, one way in which Missourians would pay for this particular program is through lost activity in the private sector. This is a concept that economists refer to as crowding out. And this actually relates to your uh, the point you brought up earlier about what could be in the absence of this project. If the air tropolis subsidies pass, then the average Missourian would effectively pay at least $80 for this legislation, either through higher taxes or through a reduction in services elsewhere. This means that the average family for in Missouri would pay at least $320 primarily to subsidize warehouse construction and operation in the St. Louis area. If Missourians were able to keep more of their earnings, if the family of four could keep their $320, then they would eat at more restaurants, spend more nights in hotels, buy a nicer car, make upgrades, make upgrades to their home, and so on. With the higher tax burden, Missourians inevitably scale back their spending and this activity is lost. And this is what would happen if uh, this program would pass. If tax credits generate economic activity, then they do so only at the expense of other forms of economic activity. The money that is spent in this program could otherwise benefit Missourians through a tax reduction or through another form of state spending. And now I want to focus on concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. Because the China Hub project would be located in St. Louis, people living near St. Louis will receive more of the benefits, but other taxpayers in Missouri will have to help shoulder the cost. Essentially, it shrinks the tax base. Even though 65% of Missourians do not live in the St. Louis region, according to the 2010 census, they will still have to pay for this program with their tax monies. A taxpayer in Joplin or Sedalia will have to pay proportionately the same as a taxpayer in St. Louis, despite the fact that he doesn't directly benefit from this policy. Currently, almost 4 million Missourians live outside the St. Louis region. Given that each of them would pay at least $80 in more taxes because of this policy, Missourians living outside of St. Louis will be forced to pay $310 million on this project. In other words, this policy would remove $310 million from the economy in the rest of the state and funnel it into the hands of a few in St. Louis. The editorial board at the St. Louis Business Journal certainly gets this idea. Earlier this month they wrote, quote, this is essentially a St. Louis only measure that's an insult to the rest of the state making us look like the greedy urban jerks that outstate legislators love to hate, not to mention our colleagues in Kansas City, end quote. Speaking of our friends in Kansas City, they in particular will see more costs and benefits. Kansas City residents will collectively pay $37 million for this policy. However, they're unlikely to receive direct benefits from the policy because they live 235 miles away from Lambert Airport. I wonder, whether sending $37 million to St. Louis is the best use for Kansas City residents' money. Perhaps it could be better spent on schools and roads in Kansas City, or return to Kansas City res residents to spend and invest in the private sector. So please don't get me wrong. Audrey and I are both enthusiastic supporters for, for free trade. 
I similarly don't want to build a wall around Missouri. When, tra when free trade uh, occurs, everyone benefits. Uh, we just do not believe that this plan is the best way to go about it. Providing nearly half a billion dollars of tax incentives to subsidize debt and warehouse construction without a concrete commitment from a foreign firm or a comprehensive study is misguided. This policy will likely do more harm than good to the Missouri economy. And I question what the, what's the rush? Uh, where's the guarantee? Uh, apparently, it may come out this afternoon, but where's the study that shows that this project will be successful? <coughs> Let's see that study and then have a conversation about whether or not awarding subsidies is the best strategy to go about this. So, and tax credits are also, it's, it's important to note that tax credits are out of control in Missouri. They're increasing faster than state revenues, and studies repeatedly show that they fail to produce the results that they promise. Most recently, for example, the East-West Gateway Council of Governments concluded that local government has provided $5.8 billion in subsidies uh, to private developers in St. Louis, and the region does not have much to show for it. Both the Tax Credit Review Commission and the Missouri State Auditor's Office has recommended changes that would limit tax credits, but so far lawmakers have adopted none. The legislature um, should implement measures that limit and not expand tax credits in Missouri, or at least investigate whether this is the best strategy, best tool for economic development in the state. So we do have a shared goal, an economy that's thriving and attractive to new businesses. If we're serious about growing the economy, we should abandon the failed policies of the past and investigate different strategies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go, I just want to make note that it sounds like you're advocating more money for social spending. And if I recall correctly, the Show Me Institute was against the autism bill last year. I'm sorry? The, the autism bill, I believe the Show Me Institute had a, an editorial piece against the autism legislation last year. So I'm glad to see that the Show Me Institute is advocating more money being spent on social programs now. That wasn't my implication. I didn't work on that particular thing. Any questions? Senator Dixon. Uh, earlier in your testimony, you referenced my question of the previous witness. Um, and then uh, your reference to the St. Louis uh, Business Journal, I believe, in the editorial. Um, before I ask you a question, I just mentioned I probably take greater offense at being called out state. I'm from Springfield, and I don't have any, you know, I'm not in the St. Louis area, and I support this legislation wholeheartedly because I think it's good for the entire state. Um, but that I'm more concerned about that mentality that we're not in state, we're out state, um, than I know anything else because. You know, we don't need those kind of divides in Missouri, and that's part of what has hampered progress in the past. But my question specifically is, going back to what um, I asked of the previous witness, if you would please clarify what you said pointed to that question, because I still don't see anything where we're talking about the lost opportunity and where that cost has been calculated. Um, and then specifically, what services you use the word services would be um, a, that that also is a concern but I won't go into a big statement about that because I don't believe the state provides services uh, or benefits but if you could uh, enumerate on what services you think uh, we need to be uh, funding with with those opportunity dollars if you will and then also um, how it be, how how that testimony would have addressed my previous concern Sure, sure. Um, when I say services, I just mean other government programs. Um, I, I'm speaking in very general terms. I'm talking about education. Bureaucracy. Um, yeah, building roads, uh, fixing potholes, stuff like that. Those basic things I can agree with are functions, but if we're talking about services, there's a lot of people rolling these halls talking about benefits for this, that, and the other, which well, I, in my opinion, are not a function of state government. But okay. anyway, to that point, I, yeah. that answers that question. Um, specifically to the lost opportunity cost, if you could address that. Certainly. Well, I would say that it's an impossible to calculate with certainty what could have been in the absence of this policy. However, um, what I described in my testimony is when you have a large public works pro program like this, when, when you have a large tax credit program like this, uh, people are uh, 
course, to for taxpayers contribute more of their earnings, a greater percentage of their earnings, towards the program. And so, as a result, it means that they have less money to spend in the private sector. To potentially. Save, but, um, potentially, because otherwise they could they could see a reduction in services too. It's some combination. Some of, some of that, though, I would have to say, and, and I'll go back to the chair, but some of that also uh, comes from a concept that any money that's not collected by government is actually just tax money that we didn't collect, which I fundamentally disagree with that whole mindset. A tax credit is not, and, and the courts even have ruled on that in various cases, one in particular, but um, th those are not state dollars. Well, agreed. I agree that it's not state dollars. I, I'm just saying as a consequence of programs like this, Missourians, taxpayers, have less money to spend for themselves. And so- Potentially. Potentially. Uh, it's difficult to calculate because it was certainly how much can be taken out, but they're gonna eat at fewer restaurants, they're gonna spend fewer nights at hotels. But there, the, the very strong likelihood also exists that in the long term, they because of the economic growth we could see substantially and perhaps exponentially more. Agree. Okay. I just want to make sure that, and I, again, I would like to emphasize that I would love to see some sort of a uh, more exhaustive study on that end of it as well. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Richard. Just, Mr. Chairman, just briefly, uh, someone has done a job on the way you mentioned my city. It's done most of the economic development for Singles region. Um, us poor people that are barefoot and corn cob pipes have done more to back up St. Louis and the community in Kansas City than, frankly, some of the St. Louis elected people. And the reason we have is because we understand what's at the other end of the highway, which is St. Louis. And as, as they progress and do well, the rest of us will too. Everything that the Shoei Institute is for, I'm against, and everything they're against, I'm for. And I would both conservatives, I don't understand that. I mean, we fought, we fought the organization on the Bombardier in Kansas City. Yeah, it was a stretch. Didn't work. This may be a stretch, but I've been to St. Louis. I'm there almost twice a month as in Kansas City. And I've got business people and, and friends when I lived in St. Louis that are begging for something new and creative so we take a chance. And I think the chairman has a great opportunity here. To take a chance on something, and if it doesn't happen, nothing's, nothing uh, is given away, no tax credit. Granted, the lady is right, tax credits may be a little uh, uh, overwrought, and I think there's a mechanism to address that, and the chairman has uh, a plan for that. But I will say that until Missouri is ready to take a chance on something new, we'll just be a a lackluster state, we'll have all our kids move away, our universities will disintegrate, our highways will disintegrate, our schools don't have to worry about it because there'll be no one going to school because there won't be tax money on the day. So I respect the lady's opinion. Again, I think we take a chance. I think we move forward and I support the chairman and I will support St. Louis every time I get a chance. Thank you. We have a question, Senator Um I'm curious, uh, a couple things actually. First of all, um, we're kind enough to quote some of the business journal. And I'm curious to know what the Shoney Institute's opinion would be on their, their proposed outcome, which is we simply offer a $60 million tax credit for the four versus. So, what's your opinion of that? Opinion? Well, I haven't studied, studied that particular point. Well, that was the second half of the editorial that I quoted. Okay. Yeah, fair. Um, Similar to how you said earlier uh, in response to the question and answer se session of Audrey, uh, so you're for it or against it. And uh, I testified in front of the tax credit review commission by September, and I have been a very vocal supporter, supporter of the total elimination of targeted tax credits in Missouri, and that holds true here too. I, I think that Missourians would be better off if they were able to uh, keep their earnings and spend them themselves in the private sector. So I do not support uh, kind of a halfway. So you would like the idea of suggesting that the as a general editorial is correct in pointing out the fact in their opinion that the rest of the state subsidizes it, but the conclusion they come to you is. Uh, I, I agree with their criticism of the 
project. Uh, I, I don't fully support the policy recommendation. But Second thing, it makes um, complaints. probably unlike most of the members in this board, I appreciate you coming forward today. Um, this is someone who uh, economics is kind of a hobby, I study. I'm a member of the Shoney Institute, as well as many other think tanks. Um, and I like to stay current and the rest of different thoughts and ideas. But one of my favorite economic terms that all my teachers use over and over again, and us in business and fans always laugh when we think about this, is this concept of all things being equal. And that's something that you're study economics, it sounds like in school. So that's where the theoretical world comes in. And they say, well, all things being equal, then well, here's our supply line, here's our demand line, and we're gonna, we're gonna now go forward with our great discourse and our great study, assuming all things are equal. I think what Sharon spoke to today. It's the reality that the world, all things are not equal. And there's the theoretical, and there's the reality. And as much as I enjoy sitting down and going through the theoretical, I think that um, it helps for, and again, maybe that's your role, maybe that's your role in the discourse, is to be the theoretical go-to. Um, unfortunately, in this capital building, it's all about the reality and the real, and all things are not equal. And when it comes to economic development in and around this region, clearly all things are not theoretically perfect. So again, I appreciate you coming forward. It was really interesting part of the testimony and I look forward to your next publication. Can, can I respond to that? Sure. Uh, uh, yes, uh, with, to that last point, uh, I agree that economics is uh, separate from natural sciences because it's it can't really be studied in the laboratory. We're kind of going through it, you know, as we are. I mean, um, however, I, I think that my focus here uh, is very reality-based. I think that um, the idea of uh, this, this particular policy awarding close to half a billion dollars in, in tax incentives to a small group is, the hope is that it would encourage trade, but I think that the reality is that it won't. Well, okay, let me follow up on it. If it doesn't, do we extend any tax credits? If, if it doesn't encourage trade? Correct. You mean after we go through the policy? You know, after we enact well, it? Well, I, I do want to, and I do appreciate coming. I just want to, make, I want to know that you understand the bill. Because you're here oh, I, I read it. The bill. Yeah. So uh, what is your understanding of how the tax credits are awarded for facilities? But it, it, it was what Audrey outlined in the, we offer, uh, tax credits to support the, the subsidization of these um, how does the that warehouses. Work? How does that work? I don't have the text of the legislation in front of me. Well, you're testifying against the bill, okay? And I'll, I'll just explain how it works, which is you build a building, it's a $25 million building, you operate it, you get a portion of it streamed over five years each year, you have to prove that you're getting the economic activity and the jobs. So if those buildings never get built, my point is, if the buildings never get built and we don't have the trade, there's never a tax credit. So it's a very different reality from what you're explaining, which is we're spending 500 million and hoping that people come. Right. The reality is, if they come, at that point we have the infrastructure because of the trade. Right. So it's, it's just it's different. It's a different sequence of logic here. Yeah. Sure, my guess is that what she really means to say is that she's against the business journal's recommendation as a just to trade for because that would then show no evidence of you know, successful. Sure. No, sure. Very good reason they so we thought that in their mental politics, they was that work. Well, maybe we'll find out on Friday's edition. No. Uh, my response is that if it's such a great idea, then there's a lot of entrepreneurs in St. Louis with great ideas, with multiple uh, skills. Uh, let them take risks and bear the burden. And, and so there's a problem. Just so. Yeah, incremental change. So just, I just want to follow up on my comments. Really, I want to make it very clear. I failed to thank you for coming. I want to make it very clear that I really do appreciate you coming. Uh, as several others have said, and I, I appreciate the Shoney Institute for the stance that they've taken on several things. Uh, principled stance. I mean, we'll just have to dis agree to disagree on this one. But uh, it takes a lot of courage to come in and, and testify in a group full of people that are in favor of something and testify against it. Uh, and I do appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions? And thank you again. I, really, I do appreciate it. Obviously, I, I believe in it. Uh, you're, you're passionate. I'm passionate. That's what this process is all about. So I do appreciate you taking the time to come up to Jeff.
city, it's not easy to get in that expression. Thank you.